Ladies and gentlemen, I've known Neil Giuseppe for many years. He and I are both media people. Um, I started before he did, and I think he joined us, he joined the media world in the 70s, in the early 70s. I've seen him move up the ladder from TTT newscaster to head of news to managing director of the Trinidad Broadcasting Company, and finally into his own public relations consultancy, from which incidentally he retired in 2007. He has had an outstanding career as journalist, newscaster, media manager, and corporate owner executive. I later discovered his other talents as Calypso manager, Freemason, actor, debater, and as a gambler who won $100,000 one night and lost $80,000 another night. <laughs> But what has impressed me even more than these accomplishments is that he has emerged from this book as a powerful lover, not of the one night stand variety, but so much more significantly of life, of people, of travel, of the standards which guide our lives, and most of all of his dear wife and family. Neil is a gifted writer from whom word, for whom words um, and, and language both flow easily. A gift undoubtedly from his parents who we clearly loved very deeply. Incidentally, they were both prolific writers in their own right. His mother was regarded a, as an authority of the English language and she wrote a specialist column in the Trinidad Guardian for many years. Theirs was clearly a tightly did caring family, which had a powerful influence on the lives of Neil and his sister, Diane. Diane. With an N. <laughs> so really, it was an easy decision for me to accept his kind invitation to launch his book. So no regrets, and the journey continues. But his is a different type of autobiography with the first part written in almost diary style. It is dominated by the gripping account of his battles with cancer and the wholesome experiences which that produced. And I, I must say he either made copious notes of his interactions with his doctors at that time, he has a prodigious memory, or he did an intensive cancer training program during his stint at Mona for. Uh, <laughs> you've heard the description of it, and uh, I thought it was excellent and very gripping. And uh, I'm sure it could be useful for many people. The clear outlines of his cancer experience and the humanness of how he lived through this most difficult period are instructive, and I feel certain will be helpful to many. His candor in telling it like it is emerges as a distinctive feature of his personality and quickly, quickly establishes credibility. He has addressed societal problems by using the relatively novel approach of sharing his experiences and his concerns. This stimulates controversy as much as it provides sharp commentary on the generally deteriorating standards which surround us. I think I heard that a short while ago. He refers, for instance, and I may tell you that I had some of these instances which, having heard the previous speakers, I've had to delete to avoid repetition, but I can tell you just one that escaped her notice. And this one refers to a former Trinidad and Tobago cricket captain and West Indies test opening batsman, who in speaking on radio stated, the team was out for 333 runs with one batsman remaining on 23 not out. <laughs> and then, of course, then went on about the dead man who had seen walking on the road a few, you know. I wouldn't repeat those, I'd save those for you. He invokes his mother's legacy, telling us, and he quotes, sadly, my dearly beloved mother went to her grave totally frustrated by the fact that as a nation, 
We continue to make ourselves look foolish in the eyes of the world by perpetuating a grammatical error in the most important statement any nation can make its national anthem. Failure to have, the corrected, to, to have this corrected, he points out, was one of the only two things which she wanted to accomplish in her lifetime but failed. He refers, of course, to the line, here every creed and race finds an equal place. It is not find. Our author properly emphasizes, it is finds. Yet, at every level, we continue to perpetuate this basic and simple error and expect our children to believe us when we say that grammar is important. There's much in this book that has been splendidly told by our author. He has a passion for sport and proudly proclaims he's been a sports fanatic all his life. Golf is at the top of his list, followed by cricket, table tennis, and football. He has traveled extensively, visiting most of the Caribbean countries to play golf. I cannot confirm that his performance matches his undoubted enthusiasm <laughs> for the sport, for I know nothing about <coughs> birdies and bogeys and double bogeys or par fours. But he tells us that he played his best golf in life in 2014. His handicap reached down to 10, and he posted a score of 74, shooting 34 on the front nine and 40 on the back. But I, enough, I know nothing about golf, <laughs> nothing. But Neil has painted a full and engrossing picture for the Caribbean golfing community, and there's much in the book that will keep them fully entertained. Now we turn to cricket. And I wonder how many of you are familiar with the name Sylvester Clark. Are any of you aware of that name? Some are. It has something to do with chronology, I believe. However, this is the Barbadian. This story is very entrancing in, in the book. This is the Barbadian fast bowler about whom Steve Waugh, then captain of the Australian cricket team, said, the only time in his cricketing life he has ever felt in danger was once facing Clark in a county match in England. He emphasized, I mean danger for my life. He added that he could also feel the will of his Somerset teammates, disintegrating a full week before having to face Clark in a match. <laughs> By the time they were changing for the game, half of them were out already. He described the experience of facing Clark as something you cannot prepare for. It is an assault both physically and mentally. And the moment you weaken and think about what might happen, you're either out or injured. <laughs> he described one spell as the most awkward and nastiest of his career. Viv Richards described Clark as the only bowler he ever felt uncomfortable facing. Then David Gower, had the padding, thumb guard, and most of his thumb ripped from his hand, ending up near third slip. This man, Clark, was unknowable, mindless, and dead-eyed. His bouncer followed the batsman like a heat-seeking missile that he bowled with bad intentions. Such testimonials are seldom given by hard-nosed professionals but our author captured some very selective information while getting behind the events. Then there was Lawrence Rowe's brilliant 302 against England in 1974, and the role Derek Murray played in talking him through to that third century. And I think you'll find that fascinating as well, but not, not tonight. A story, however, that squarely puts into perspective the magnitude of Brian Lara's <coughs> voracious appetite for runs. With seven double centuries, three triple centuries, 375 and 400 test matches in 1994 and 2004, and would you also believe it, 500 runs in an English county match. This is one man. Now perhaps you would like to hear what was written in the prestigious international magazine Cricket Monthly 
by a leading Australian journalist, Bob Poche. Now, I heard about this, Steve, but I never saw it until I saw it in your book. I share with you the opening and closing paragraphs of what I consider every cricket lover must read. It's called The Lara Nightmare. How could I not hate Brian Lara? He was exactly the kind of cocky, flashy, show off that Australians are trained from birth to despise. Especially if the show off is not Australian. And doubly so if the show off happens to be very, very, very good. To see a man that is too big for his boots is an anathema, anathema for many an Aussie fan. To see the same man demonstrate that in fact he fits into those boots perfectly is utterly unbearable. My memories of Lara are mainly of frustration, of games that my beloved Australia would have won easily were it not for this contemptuous aristocrat standing in the way plundering great and average bowlers alike. And he did it with such a born to rule attitude that you grew to hate the sight of him. He had an arrogance that you never sensed in Sachin Tendulkar, his rival for his rival for the title of the world's best. But Tendulkar was a much harder man to hit. And it goes on and on in this beautifully written style. Unfortunately, it ends. But then the final paragraph. You could hate this remarkable batsman. You could curse his name and grind your teeth whenever he hove into sight. But you couldn't, but yet, made every moment of accumulation a work of art. Brian Charles Lara, you gave us much if only a little less of it had been against Australia. <laughs> now, I've selected these three cricket stories because I suspect they're little known, even to lovers of the game. They also emphasize the journalist in Neil Giuseppe, always looking for the different angle or story. There's something very refreshing about this book, which I have read with genuine pleasure. It is about a life well lived, a life being loved which gives its own love freely in return. And I had that confirmed this evening as I listened earlier. A most admirable story, one worthy of emulation and one which we can as well encourage even no more to your children to read. I warmly and heartily recommend that you read it. Thank you.